with more Ruby fight scene analysis. This time we are going to be doing Pura Nikos versus Team Cardinal. General background for this, Pura, it'll be interesting to see what she does purely because she's, she's like a champion in a tournament ring, which, well, that can translate over to general aptitude with weapons more often than not. It will not translate over into actual combat experience as, well, in a tournament, it is going to be less lethal and more point-based, usually. And whereas in a combat scenario, where, for example, someone with, I would say, roughly the same level of skills, in this case, Mercury, would excel better purely because he is used to fighting to the death and as an assassin or hired gun, whereas Pira is, like I said, a tournament fighter. So, without any further ado, you guys know the drill. Down below there'll be a link for the Ruby Reactor's Discord server. I do recommend joining. It's a bit quiet at the moment, but we have some great YouTubers there. One such one who recently just became the true part of the fandom, you know, finally saw the last episode of episode 3, with that reactor being uh, Ghost the Rebel, believe I said that correct. So yeah, without any further ado, let's get started. Okay, first off, Pura's armor. We've got a set of modified greaves and a gauntlet on her shield arm. Personally, I would, I would have put the gauntlet on the sword arm so that there's more protection. Probably both if I had the choice. But it does give her a nice asymmetrical design with the a sash flowing off her waist. Combat skirt or aggressively short shorts. Heels. They're heels. You're not going to be able to go much of anywhere. Overall, the armor isn't too bad except for where it leaves huge gaping openings along upper legs. Particularly, that'd be like what the carotid artery. Okay, so, now we get into a bit of actual combat, and as we've been told, Pura is a prodigy when it comes to fighting. Maybe not a prodigy, but you know, she knows how to, she knows her way around a sword. So. First strike, that looks like just a simple overhead strike, followed by a turn and another strike. Overall, no complaints other than just the usual leaving yourself open, which has become common. Okay, so first strike is up, second turn down. Shield is, main complaint, shield is being thrown too far out. You want to keep the shield, particularly one of that size, in front of you and at an angle so blows can glance off. Her ferrokinesis, metal manipulation, whatever that is. Okay, and this is a 4v1, God, that's a tight corset. Okay, going into a spear. Main complaint here. She pushed in too fast. If this was... more realistic, she would have kept her distance using the... Uh, spear and its reach to her advantage. You know, controlling the battlefield keeping good distance and timing, 
preferably stacking the opponents with each other, which would more or less look like a uh, pencil sharpener where it will be Pira and then these guys are Team Cardinal. If they get on either side of you, that's bad because you'll have to defend two fronts. And as Germany has learned multiple times, that doesn't work out. But with this, you would want to keep them stacked so they can't advance two at a time, giving you a two-front battle. Keep them stacked with each other. And another thing you'd want to do, try to get them singled out so you can take them down one at a time. Cool. Running in. The way this is edited is fairly good. Transform it into the hunting shotgun, and then into the spear. Hewing spear by the looks of it, with a very hoplite design. Slash at the leg, could be to take him out. And there is Cardin Winchester's weapon, the Executioner. Named thusly because the Cardin, Cardinal of Winchester executed Joan of Arc, or was directly responsible, and deflecting with the actual fight, deflecting a blow from a blunt force weapon off of your back with your arm twisted, that's a good way to bruise the shit out of you and possibly break something. It definitely used as a, more of a hewing spear. Okay, how did he fall? There is no reason he should have... Okay, looks like she might have gone knocked the back of his knee. Which... It might work, but that could overextend yourself. And, again, transforming the weapon a whole bunch and somehow she flies up and now for quite possibly my favorite weapon in the show just as from you know a quick glance we only see it you know a little bit Hal shot that is used by Skylark and is probably one of the more possibly realistic weapons. And, dear God, I love it. It is literally just a revolver inside a... What looks like it could be a... Either a long sword or arming sword. It's probably going to be an arming sword. It has pretty much everything I would want. And again, thrown, and the reason why that'll work out is, again, her ferrokinesis, yep, thrown, deflects. What should have been done here is, our dear friend with the sort of halberd, he should have rushed in at the same time while she was unarmed. She doesn't use the ferrokinesis of offensively, interestingly enough. That would make her a much more dangerous opponent. What he should have done, taking advantage of the lack of Pharaoh, is just go in for a strike while she's occupied. Just keep pressing your advantage of her being disarmed. Again. Oh boy, just shotgun blast to the chest. The main complaint here is they're not using timing well or tactics working as a unit. That's a lovely pause. With the main thing, again, fighting with multiple people can be more detrimental than it is beneficial. You'll need to be able to work together well enough to not get in each other's way that, you know, that's why a lot of the times you just have to drill 
group unit tactics because, for example, with the Roman Legion, you know, they're completely moving in synchronization. And they're so effective because they're synchronized and it's trained. These guys, they're very much just a bunch of schmucks who got in on their individual prowess and are trying to 4v1 someone and aren't doing too hot. Massive strike to the ground. Oh god. Okay. Huge complaint here. Massive strike overextending. With that, you don't even need to roll out of the way. Just slip inside his guard and sweep his leg. He is going down like a sack of potatoes. And at that point, grapple him, blade up in a battlefield setting, just boom, right to the throat. He's out for the count and bleeding out inside his armor. Backhand. Ugh. You, there's so much time in that. You can just pop a spear, you know, extend it into him. These guys, I, I do like the armor, though. Too much spinning. With that, what should be done is just hack and stab. You know, because there's a... I believe there's a spear tip and a firing mechanism within the halberd. So therefore just, you know, fire it, deflect. That gives Cardinal or Cardin enough time to come in and go for a strike. Again, unification is not this group's strong suit. I believe that is what this was very strongly trying to show. Uh, what's his face? Gray hair. The, yeah, the dark gray hair guy. He is horribly off balance. They finally got a hit in on Pyrrha, though. Yep, horribly off balance. Sweep. And... These guys are... These guys don't know how to fight very well. And that also could just be, again, Piero's background of being a, a arena champion coming into effect. Knowing how to mess with your opponents, make it look theatrical. Because a lot of the time, if, you know, if we're sticking to her being Greek-inspired, and from what I've seen of the show, Greek and Roman-inspired things sort of get melded together every once in a while. They... Uh, force crack. They will... The gladiator fights were mostly theatrics. With a good dose of combat added in. So, enjoying the crowd could possibly be a strong point for what Pyrrha had to do. Or, you know, making the crowd interested. Dual wielding. My thoughts on that... I think you guys know my thoughts on dual wielding. It's hard to do right, and if you do, it's devastating, but it's often more danger to yourself. Okay, so, from what I can see, Sky, he's not doing too bad. He'll... You know, those... He often goes into a semi-legitimate guard position and is holding his own fairly well until he realized that mixed martial arts is a thing. For a jumping attack, there's a very quick solution to this, Pira. Go inside his guard. There's the opening right at the bottom below the breastplate, stick out your spear, extend it, he is going to impale himself, or since, you know, there's aura, it'll knock the wind out of him so bad that you can just beat on him while everyone else is recovering. 
Again, massive strike. Repeated firing. What's his face with the twin blades? He's Sonic the Hedgehog. I Sonic the Hedgehog just I'm not gonna comment further on that. Okay, this is good. They're keeping up the assault and tempo. Main complaint here, they're not flanking. Pyrrha is an experienced fighter, but even she would have trouble keeping up with an assault, particularly from a fast weapon, the two daggers, and a relatively heavier hitting weapon, the arming sword, which also is fast enough, just coming from both sides. And, yep. Unnecessary spinning. That is gonna hurt really bad with the spiked knee. Oh. You know, the extension of the green. That'll break teeth, break nose, bruise. And again, Pure is just fucking tanking these. Okay, with how Cardin's using his mace, believe it or not, that's not very effective. What you normally want to do, strikes that lead into one another, which will often result into more of a figure eight, or, you know, just keep going, you know, just keeping up the assault. They're meant to crack armor and do bl absolute blunt force trauma, which will leave nasty bruises and broken bones. Cardin, he's lucky he has armor. Okay, this is actually good. I often you see when someone is dual wielding, touched on this in my last episode, you know, the fight with... Sun and then and Roman. The White Fang Mooks, they would do dual wielding strikes, you know, in pairs. Where with that, you wanna, you know, you often just use one for defense and offense, which is the reason why, uh, you know, for a rapier and dagger style, you would use the dagger for defense and rapier for offense. With this, that appears to be slightly what he's doing. And he's keeping up the assault. Believe it or not, that's actually a fairly accurate move within martial arts. It's used a fair bit in bow staff forms and had to learn it. It's fun once you get to know how to use it. And other... Yep, he's... Yep, keeping up the assaults. And my man turned his back to his opponent. You don't do that. Okay. And now we have a little instance of friendly fire. Considering the weight of that and how effortly he moves it, we're dealing with a guts issue from Berserk. That guy is getting his chest caved in purely because of how heavy it is. With Guts, there's a blade on it, so it'll just go through it, through the armor. And, you know, the armor of the three guys behind him. But because that is bludgeoning, assuming it's metal armor, that is leaving a dent so deep, you're going to be able to see his lungs struggling to read through all the blood that'll be pouring in. Again, I think that's a dust-enhanced attack. And we have gravity-defying fights and a suplex to end things. <sighs> Full scorpion and a flip-up. If I had to guess, I would probably say that all of those fancy flips 
were being aided by the ferrokinesis purely because there's no way that you're gonna not, you know, be falling that quick. Overall, this is a flashy as hell fight. It's fun to watch. But in terms of, you know, actual historical or just logical legitimacy, this is absolutely horrid, except for, oddly enough, some of the throwaway characters. Yeah, overall, I'd say this fight is like a 5 out of 10. It's about average for a ruby fight in terms of realism, or in terms of enjoyment, I'd say like a 7. It's above average, nothing too fancy. So, now that I've turned a 2 minute and 10 second video into something that's probably around the 20 minute mark, you guys know the drill, uh, watch the original, Link to Rooster Teeth will be in the description. Ruby Reacts Discord server. Again, a bunch of really great people there. And yeah, until next time, this is Elvin Prince, signing off.